This is Transit Unplugged. I'm Paul Comfort. Ridership is a big issue across America and the world when it comes to public transportation. What can we do to get ridership back up? After the COVID pandemic, when ridership went down, everyone was basically hoping we could get back to what they were calling pre-pandemic levels, although people don't want to talk about that anymore. But a lot of transit agencies, according to the American Public Transportation Association and other groups, are still at around 70 to 80 percent of what was called the pre-pandemic ridership levels. And we're trying lots of different things. I talked to Ron Kilcoin, who's had 40 years of experience in the transit industry. He has served as general manager of three transit systems, and he did a study and published it and has been out talking about it. And I invited him on the podcast to talk about we have more of a conversation today than an interview. I wanted to have him and I both talk together as two longtime transit veterans about what seems to be working right now in the industry to increase ridership. And so we go through some various tenets, each of us talking about what we've seen work. And then at the end, Ron gives you the summary of his work. So be sure to stay to the end and hear him there. Also, if you like the podcast and like what you're hearing generally every week on our show, please be sure to give us a rating right after you listen to it. Go to the rating. Give us how many stars you think we deserve. Maybe leave a comment for us on Apple or Spotify, wherever you're listening. That helps us understand what our listeners want and also helps share the message and spread the message with others. You can be a transit evangelist, too. And if I can ever answer any questions you might have about public transportation, email them to me at paul.comfort at transitunplugged.com and I'll read your question and I may even read it on a future podcast and give it an answer. Thanks so much. Now let's join the conversation with Ron Kilcoin. Ron, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Great to be here, Paul. So you've had quite uh, a bit of experience. Uh, you were a general manager of three transit systems, as we mentioned, Santa Clarita Transit, Greater Bridgeport Transit, where I had some experience as a contractor and Lane Transit District in Eugene, Oregon. Those were big jobs, man. Well, and I actually, before then, I, I my first foot 12 years in the industry was working and planning at AC Transit. Wow. And I worked started as a planner, entry planner, worked my way up to being the manager of, of research and planning at AC Transit. And they actually initiated their first restructuring. And I think one of the things that got me frustrated is, is just through doing the planning was the marketing people didn't know how to market it and the operations people didn't want to change anything. And, yeah. uh, and so I thought really what I want to do is, is be able to run the whole show. I wanted to share that background with our listeners right up front to let them know that you're not just a researcher. You're not just working on policy, seeing where transit service could be increased. You, you do service plans for uh, TMD, transportation management and design. You're not operating from an ivory tower. You've actually implemented a lot of these changes in the mm -hmm. past. And so the things we're going to talk about today, which are critical to our industry at this moment, you have hands-on experience, not just planning them, but actually implementing them. Because it's one thing to sit in a room with a bunch of college graduates and say, oh, wouldn't this new design be great? But it's another thing to actually implement it. And in your comments just a minute ago that you shared, you said when you were a service planner at one agency early on in your career, it frustrated you that, let's say, marketing wouldn't do the work required to promote it, or operations didn't want to make the changes. And all three of those, Ron, are critical to making these changes to get our ridership back up, aren't they? And I want you to talk about your three-legged stool, because I think that's a great way to kick off this conversation. You say there's a three-legged stool to grow transit ridership. What are those three legs, Ron? Let's talk about them. Well, all right. The first leg would be the design of the service. In other words, the question here is, why would somebody want to use transit? Well, it's got to meet their mobility or their accessibility needs. And I like to use accessibility more than mo mobility because it's really about access to jobs, access to education, access to health care, access to retail, access to social activities, yeah. access to opportunity. Okay, so let's say you design a product that meets a person's needs. Now you get to the second stool. How do they know that this product meets their needs? How can they be enticed to at least sample it? And that's the marketing, the promotional thing. So let's and talk so those, about that for just a minute. Number two, yeah. sampling it. I like that. I was at, I heard a speaker just recently say that, which was basically get them to try it one time. You're not asking them to change their whole lifestyle and to start mm -hmm. commuting if they're not a commuter. Just say, Hey, for this week, we're going to do this promotion, right? For, for Tri-Transit Week, we're going to give it to you for free for that week. Maybe not forever, 
but for that week mm-hmm. to entice them on. And we're going to give prizes and this. And if you run a good service, and you can mm-hmm. hook them, right? That's correct. Yeah. And and which of course gets you the so the first two the first two legs of those stools get the people on get get people to try transit to get to people to use transit. The third stool is what keeps them there, and that's the operations part of it. That's and that's all everything that comes to do with operations. Was the bus on time? Is the driver friendly? Is the bus clean? Does the customer feel safe? Is the service reliable that the bus isn't going to break down? Is the air conditioning working or the heating, depending on the time of year? That type of thing. So, and that's the basically the operations aspect of it. When I was in Bridgeport, I want to change the title of the operations manager to uh, the director of customer satisfaction. (laughs) I got a lot of pushback. I I got a a lot of pushback (laughs) because it not it was a new term, and oh no, if I if I go out and try to get a job somewhere else. Am I going to know what they know what it is? But really, to me, that's what the director of operations is, is the director of customer satisfaction. So you've got, you've got the, basically the three legs. And and I think that the first two legs have to do with getting people there. So I like to have an individual. I think that an organization should have a director of planning and marketing. And I would call that maybe the director of customer, customer engagement, customer customer attraction, something to that. But I like to use the customers and titles because that's really what it's all about. It's about the customer. And then the operations would be the director of customer satisfaction because that's what that the operations person is really all about is making sure the customer is satisfied so they keep coming back, their expectations being met. Wow, Ron, that's really a bold change. Operations doesn't always see themselves as focused on the end customer. They see themselves focused on the nuts and bolts. Yeah, correct. And that's, and, uh, but really it is, why are we working on the nuts yeah. and bolts? I mean, that, right, to that's- To serve the customer. Begin with the end in mind. Right. right, yeah. Like the seven habits of highly effective people. That's good, Ron. I love that. When I was in Baltimore, similarly, we had had, like most transit agencies did back in 2013, 14, 15, 16, in that time frame, there was a general decline in ridership as TNCs came into cities and took away a lot of what they call the choice riders. And a lot of CEOs were very concerned about it. I've told this story before. We were all in Florida at a CEO summit that AFTA put on, and everyone's hair was on fire, metaphorically speaking, about what are we going to do about this? And the same thing has happened post-COVID, right? Now the ridership yeah. and generally has been down 20 to 30%. Some agencies are, and we'll talk about how they're doing it in a minute. You did some research recently that I'll have you share. But what I found there, and it ties back into your point that we can't really control who comes on, but we can build access is I saw uh, what I call our North Star. And uh, I had four North Stars there, and that was safety, efficiency, reliability, and world-class customer service. And everything we did focused around that. Do you agree with those, that those are four key elements? Absolutely. And those are four key elements. And one of the issues that we deal with a lot in our work is the fact that is is running times. We're going to be starting a project for a client next month. And one of the things in, in, the, in the RFP, they said, how are we going to deal with the fact that we have to lengthen our headways from 15 minutes to 20 minutes because of traffic? And that third cornerstone you mentioned about bus, bus lanes and, and stuff like yes. that is really critical. It's like, and, you know, our response was one of the things we want to take a look at is what can we do to give priorities to the buses? I mean, it's sometimes doing lanes isn't always the it's a hard dock. It, there's still things like uh, queue jumpers and, and signal priority and where you locate bus stops. And uh, yeah, there's just a number of little things yeah. you can do. Yes. And, and, that, and I think the, the key thing to do that, I know that when I was in Eugene with, it, with MX, we were able to, with the BRT, we were able to speed it up. And the good news was that the perception was greater than the actual, but yes. that's fine. Perception yeah, is reality. Right. Yeah. But we also found that in some cases, trying to take a look at what really sped things up. In some cases, it was just the fact of off-door boarding. The fact that you had level boarding and yes. you take your ears off board, you could enter through any doors. Yeah. That, that's one thing that could really speed it up. So so I think it's important to kind of look look outside the box of how you would lay out to see how can you can make the service faster. And a bus stop location, which is a project I'm working on for another client right now, is a big thing because trying to get that sweet spot being good pedestrian access to the stop versus making sure the buses can run aren't aren't, aren't bogged down by making just too many stops. So. That's right. Most of the folks who did a Houston style 
reboot of their transit system after 2017, a big part of it was going through your system and straightening out the routes, adding high frequency routes that pulse on a regular time frame so you don't need a schedule. You just know the bus is going to be there every 10 to 15 minutes and reducing the number of bus stops. But also, Ron, would you also agree that we need to make wayfinding and signage very easy for people who haven't used transit before? I mean, those are key, aren't they, especially to try to attract new people? Oh, absolutely. And an example that I can give is is I live in the Bay Area, uh, San Francisco Bay Area. The firm I work with, TMD, is only physical offices and is, is in Carlsbad. So I work remotely, but but when I do go down there to the office, now I can get there on transit from the airport as long as the flight times are right. But that involves taking a shuttle from the airport to the old town train station where we catch poster and then catch NCTD's breeze to get to the office. But the key thing here is when you get to San Diego airport, now I knew that there was a free shuttle between San Diego, San Diego Airport and the Old Town Transit Center. Just get oh. to Carlsbad. Okay. And so I knew there was this free shuttle. But first of all, I went on the MTS website. Nothing about there. They tell me I go downtown San Diego on their bus. So I finally go, I finally found the information on the shuttle on the San Diego Airport. Okay, so I know this. Now I get to the airport. Where do I catch it? There is absolutely no signage in the airport. Yep. I'd ask somebody, where do I go catch the shuttle? So if I didn't know this existed in the first place, I would have probably just said, okay, I guess I got to go to downtown San Diego or get an Uber or what have you. That's really, really key to that. But the wayfinding is, is getting to the Bay Area example. And MTC is doing this. MTC, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, which is the MPO and regional planning agency for the Bay Area is spearheading this effort, but is to have some kind of universal wayfinding transit information. So regardless how many, tran whichever transit systems you're, you're using, you can figure out how to get around. Yeah. Because let's face it, individual person trips are not confined to the boundaries of one transit agency. And, and actually this gets into probably this whole integration issue, which is something that I've been passionate about my whole career, is it? People, when you drive anywhere, every city, every county, every state is responsible for planning, building, and maintaining the street system. But when you drive anywhere, you, how many different agencies are responsible for the streets? You never give it a thought. Transit needs to have the same work in the same way. So. That's right. And you, you helped author a study recently for the Bay Area, which shows how restoring and increasing transit service levels can play a critical role in bringing back ridership now that the pandemic is gone. And I know that we've been talking about some of your findings, but why don't you dig into that a little bit more? Tell us about it for a few minutes and your, your ultimate findings. Okay. Well, I, one of the things when I got my first GM job down in Santa Clarita was I wanted to figure out how to build ridership. So I found 10 peers, similar suburban systems like that. And I asked them for a whole bunch of metrics. And I went through the, the whole things like, all of the things we talked about earlier, like on-time performance and loneliness and so on. And I wanted to relate this to their ridership. And one of the things that came out of this was the, the only correlation I could find was the correlation between per capita service hours, the amount of service you provide per capita for this, your service area, and per capita ridership, which was the amount of ridership. I mean, I could find that I couldn't find a correlation between on, I mean, not to, not to, disagree with what we said earlier because on-time performance is important, but the correlation wasn't as strong there as it was between per capita ridership. And I did the same thing when I went to Bridgeport, when I went to Eugene, I did found peers because each of those three systems were very different from each other. So I found different yeah. peers. I still find that correlation. So when the question came to me here in the Bay Area from an organization called Seamless Bay Area was, we want to know how much service we should be providing in the Bay Area how, uh, because we want to promote a ballot measure to do that. And so how do we want to do that? And I said, well, I don't know that there's any real way. I did some research on measures to treat. And I said, there really isn't a way to kind of determine some sort of this optimum thing other than to sort of see what is the relationship between per capita ridership and per capita service hours. and now, the Bay Area is, in, in many ways, transit-rich in terms of overall, probably we're number two to the New York area in terms of per capita. 
service and per capita ridership. But the feeling was, is that despite that fact, there's just a lot of unmet transit needs still within that and that there was be needing for more funding. Um, I looked at the Bay Area system, 27 Bay Area systems, and found that when I took the 20 of the 27 systems, 20 systems that provide bus service, just focus on their bus service, ignoring the, any rail, ignoring BART and BAT for the time being. Again, I found the same correlation, but I found a really interesting thing that really I would, having started my career in the Bay Area, being a native of the Bay Area, back in the Bay Area, I would have never guessed. And that is the top three, top five transit systems. Number, Muni's number one in per capita ridership, per capita service. No surprise. AC Transit's number two. No surprise. Number three totally threw me off. Because number three in per capita service and number four in per capita ridership. So again, the correlations there was Westcat. Westcat serves Western Contra Costa County. It serves Pinole, Hercules. It is about as transit unfriendly environment as you'll find anywhere. <laughs> it's hilly, low density, suburban things. And it's like, well, why they provided a very high level of service to BART. They provided some service in San Francisco, but it also, I think, really illustrates that in any type of environment, there's still, you can still draw a correlation between the amount of service you provide and the amount of ridership you're going to generate. So what would you, based on that and based on what we've talked about today, give us your overall recommendations for transit agencies and the staff that are listening today that are still stuck around 70, 80 percent of a word we don't want to keep saying, which is post-pandemic ridership or pre-pandemic ridership, but it is what it is. People want to get that ridership back up. What is your recommendations to them right now? Well, number one is, well, of course, the, the probably the biggest challenge is when it comes to operations is you need dollars. And if you don't have the dollars, you're going to have to, you may not be able to provide the level of service that, that, that you, your community deserves. I, I think there's a couple of things. One is that on the dollar side things is that you probably should maybe do a, do a similar type of effort like this, just simply to sort of lay how much service will we should be providing. And the one thing I did not do in this research, but maybe I would say just transit systems do is that not just saying how much service we identify, how much service we should provide, but then provide what is the ROI for that? What is the, what is the return on the investment? What, what are the, benefits, the social, economic, and environmental benefits, because a politician may say, well, fine, I don't know, what, what does it matter if you carry more people? You, why, why does that matter? What do, you do, what do you do with the funding you have? I think the key thing here is, again, you've got to look at what markets can you best serve. One of the things we spend a lot of time looking at, at what we call equity priority communities, where are the communities that need the service the most, and making sure that you provide that service, looking at the off-peak periods, looking at, at where you want to focus. I mean, actually, if I want to go back a little bit, before I started AC Transit, I lived in San Francisco, I was working in retail, but I was interested in transit. So when Muni was doing their first restructuring, and this was in the late 70s, I went to all the meetings because I wanted to find out all about this stuff. I was a transit nerd. I, I And one of the things I learned at that meeting was they pointed out that our system's focused on downtown, yet 70% of the trips don't go downtown and 70% of the trips are not work trips. And this was this something back in the 70s that sort of really, when I was at AC Transit, when we tried to do the, re, the restructuring, uh, that was our focus. And so one of the things the pandemic did was sort of highlight this fact that really it isn't people just getting people nine to five people downtown, we need to lead a focus beyond that. And I think that that mindset is really, really, really critical. But every agency has got to let, take a look at their own type of situation. I think you just, you just got to kind of get back to the basics. But the amount of service you provide is probably more important than the fare you charge. And I know a lot of places feel that, well, if we just offer free service, get more people riding. If the service doesn't go where you want to go, when you want to go, free doesn't matter. I can think back of times when you've had to raise fares or you had a budget deficit. And the question is, well, do you cut service or do you raise fares? And chances are people are going to say, well, we don't really want to pay more, but raise the fares because if you cut the service, I'm not going to have something to ride. Those are good. Those are good recommendations, Ron. I think analyzing your situation, 
making a good case using KPIs for your service so that you can apply for more money. A lot of people are facing what they call the fiscal cliff with the end of the COVID funds. Mm -hmm. And then providing that higher level of service, taking people where they want to go today, which is different, right? So we've Mm -hmm. got uh, hybrid work schedules now. People are doing the three-day city where they're home on Mondays and Fridays. You may not need the level of service some days or at some times that you used to have at your peak periods. You may need to expand service like a lot of commuter rails are doing now, expand higher frequency service to nights and weekends based on what you're trying to do. I was talking with the chief innovation officer of a major transit agency just this week who told me, we now are no longer considering ourselves primarily a commuter service. We're now considering ourselves a lifestyle mobility service. And so Mm -hmm. we're focused on female riders, making sure we have room for strollers. They don't have to fold their strollers up anymore or shopping carts and So just kind of changing the focus of the agency to where people are now, that seems to be the overall arching recommendations. You get pretty good travel data. And we find that, you know, we can determine where people are traveling via all modes, by time of day, by trip purpose, between zip codes or census tracts or thousands and stuff like that. And that really tells you what are people doing? And that helps, I think that can help you sort of say, are of these major traffic flows, where can where can transit work the best? And and I think that's the key thing. And the other thing we find is that quite often we find that preconceived notions aren't existing. One of the things we found is that, for example, work we did in Los Angeles is that more people are traveling between 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. than between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. Wow. And so you displace conventional wisdom. But we've found that to be very, very helpful because, again, if you have limited resources, and even if you don't have limited resources, you always want to make sure you you focus your resources in the right place. Hey, you know? That's good. And and that's, I think that being able to look at the overall travel pattern, and there are tools that can able, able you to do that, that's, I think, very, very important to do. Well, thanks, Ron. Great conversation today, sharing some of your experiences as a general manager, and also the findings from the study you did in the post-COVID era about how folks can increase their ridership. And we'll put a link to that study on our website. Thanks for being with us today, Ron. Well, thank you, Paul. Great to be here. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Transit Unplugged. Hi, I'm Tris Hussey editor of Transit Unplugged. And thanks to this week's guest, Ron Kilcoyne, for a really insightful interview on what levers we can pull to really improve ridership at our agencies. Now, coming up next week, we have another really great episode, and it's with Dwight Farrell, GM of SMART, the agency that serves Detroit and Southeastern Michigan. Now, Dwight not only talks about his advice for people coming up in the transit industry based on his 30 years as a transit leader, but also some of the things we need to improve, especially in technology, if we want to keep up with today's transit riders. Hey, do you get the Transit Unplugged newsletter? We give you two really easy ways to get it. You can get it via email or via LinkedIn. Check the links in the show notes and sign up. Transit Unplugged is brought to you by Medaxo. At Medaxo, we're passionate about moving the world's people. And at Transit Unplugged, we're passionate about telling those stories. So until next week, ride safe and ride happy.